Uh, yeah, so um, my talk is on uh, using the Shannon entropy to find uh, high fault tolerant threshold, error correcting thresholds and fault tolerant thresholds, assuming enormous amounts of overhead. So, um, so the, way, the first basic thing we have is instead of representing our um, density matrix as a matrix, we write it as coefficients in the poly basis. You know, it's, you know, I, C sub X, C sub Y, C sub Z. And so it's a four-dimensional vector. And then as we've seen before in this um, conference, the noise that acts on a density matrix can be written in general by these 12 real parameters given by this matrix. Um, so, so um, what, what, does a what does a channel map look like for a code? Um, well, first we have to have an encoding operator that encodes, you know, I have an n, I'm encoding k qubits into n qubits, right? So I want to encode my k logical qubits into my n physical qubits with this encoding operator, E. Um, and, you know, and it acts again on that space of a, uh, density matrices, you know, the vectorized density matrices. So they're four, you know, for n qubits, they're four to the n dimensions for my, um, for, for my density matrix. And then what I do is once I get in the n dimensional space, I have a um, operator n which represents my general noise. So in general, the noise is given by a four to the n by four to the n operator. And then I have some sort of recovery operators, R sub beta. Um, and what I, that operator means it's the operator form of those recovery operators. So typically those might be some sort of tensor product of uh, poly matrices. What those do is for each of my possible syndromes, I have to choose a recovery operator to return to the um, code space. So yeah, you know, you know, I just picked some recovery operator to do that. And then finally, I decode. And de since um, the, the encoding operator in this poly basis is real, so the, de the decoding operator, I just do um, this E transpose here. Um, so uh, well, what, what do I, what can I do with that map I had before? Well, I can rewrite it a little bit. I can write it as a sum of uh, these various G superscript R betas, which um, each of these G sub R betas is the um, part, portion of the channel that was from each corresponding error syndrome. So what I can do instead of just treating it as one map and then can you know, and then just applying the same thing. What you can do is I can use this inf additional information given by the noise from the um, fr from from the uh, fr from that syndrome. Yeah, you know, I can. I can. So I have this this thing. This it's sort of like a channel, that, um, but just for that, you know, some conditional probability for with the, from that error syndrome. And what I can then use is I can then use that. Um, noise and you know from the logic so so I have this physical qubit noise I get this logical qubit noise from some error syndrome and then I pass it on to the next level of the code as physical qubit noise and what what I can then do by repeatedly doing this I can find my optimal um, re recovery operator you know if I've encoded many many times what I can do every I, I'm not throwing away any information right I'm just passing all the information I could need Need to the next level, where I can then use it to optimize um, the error recovery. You know, at the, at the top level of the code, what I'm going to do is finally have. Um, yeah, yeah. I could, what I could do is delay optimization to the top level of the code, and then you know, it's just pretty trivial to figure out you know what's the best recovery operator, say at the end. Um, yeah. So what this allows me to do is get much, you know, much better thresholds than. Um, then if, if, I'm not, if I'm not doing any optimization, let's say I always had for the 713 code, I always had the same error recoveries no matter what at each level and then use the previous information. Now what I'm going to do is um, use something called the Shannon entropy to, um, to help calculate some of the thresholds. So the Shannon entropy is uh, you know, given by the sum of the probabilities P sub I, you know, um, I mean, you know, minus P sub I log base two P sub I. 
Um, so, well, well, let me explain why I want to do this. So, it's, so um, it turns if I have one type of noise, let's say X errors, I have the 713 code, and um, I have um, probability, some probability of an X error, and um, the I have these different levels of. Uh, levels of the code. So what happens is that the first level of the code, you see I have, um, right, th this is right by the threshold. I have 11% and then it's like 15% at this, I mean at the zeroth level is 11, then it's like 15, then 15 and a half, 16. What happens, so you see right at the actual threshold, it keeps getting sort of noisier and noisier at first. Um, the, the actual threshold is the middle line, which is for, for 10.9632%. The other two lines are a little above, a little below the threshold. As you can see, so the thing where it's a little below the threshold would take take many, many, many levels to get back down to the 11% um, noise I started with. So, you know, so just looking at the um, probabilities of an error, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't work quite so well for trying to calculate the thresholds. Um, now, on the other hand, what if I look at the Shannon entropy? of each of these cases. Well, you, you see all this stuff is pretty close to a half. Um, this is because the 713 CSS code corrects the X and Z, or, you know, can correct X and Z or essentially independent of each other. So if I had probability um, P of both some sort of X error and some sort of Z error, then there would be, sh the Shannon entropy would be, um, the, you know, and the Shannon entropy was about one, which was conjectured to be what sort of noise you could correct. You, you know, you could, you, that, that would be determine what you could correct. Here I have a, so here's about a half because it's only the one type of noise. And so you see um, what happens is, the, the, at the threshold, it's pretty close to uh, one half, um, that, that middle line. And the other two lines, you know, like the, the line below the threshold clearly goes below one half. And, you know, you know it, it's much easier th through calculations to determine that the middle line is the threshold here, just the way, the way you know, that the, because you use this special value of uh, one half that, you know, had been originally been conjectured to be the threshold. And, and it gives a good estimate for the threshold. Um, so I have this paper, um, so it's be being published, uh, Physical Review uh, A Rapid, any day now. Um, see, it's here on the archive. So what it, it's called Correctable Noise of Quantum Error Correcting Codes Under Adaptive Concatenation. What I did was I, I extended an approach that David Pulin used of optimizing the recovery operators. Um, what, I, what I assume what, what, what I did for my calculations uh, was assumed you had the same polynoise PX, PY, PZ on each qubit. And I used the, the techniques I just outlined with a combination of doing calcula some calculations exactly, but then for most of the calculations at the higher level, I had to use Monte Carlo. And what you know, I did was I, I calculated thresholds. And below these thresholds, the Shannon entropy goes to zero, which means that it can correct the noise. And in general, above the thresholds, in most cases, it'll go, the Shannon entropy will go to two. So the, these thresholds are these thresholds are very important. But in order to calculate the thresholds, you have to go out many levels to see, sort of asymptotically, what the um, critical values converge to. Um, so I did this for some, the 513 and 713 code for depolarizing noise and then that other type of noise I just mentioned where you have prob independent probability P of a, some sort of phase flip and some independent probability P of some sort of bit flip. And so you see in both, the, and then I compare these to the hashing rate. So you see in both these cases, they correct pretty close to the hashing rate, but not quite, you know, significant to, you know, note that these are definitely um, much, you know, definitely less than the hashing rate. Even though, you know, the hashing rate, uh, as I've mentioned, is a pretty good approximation. Um, the hashing rate, again, is when the Shannon entropy is one. Um, so, so, so the, now the question is, so those codes couldn't correct up to the hashing rate. So the question is, can you correct above the hashing rate ever? Well, so the, um, so for the, and here we assume uh, depolarizing noise, same probability of X, Y, and Z error. And we look at the fidelity, which is the probability of I, no error, or one minus, th you know, if I have probability P of each X, Y, and Z error, then it's one minus three P is my fidelity. So the, the um, hashing rate is uh, 0.81071. Uh, 
And um, by, by some sort of random coding techniques, uh, are supposed to get you up to the hashing rate. Um, and this had been conjectured to be the uh, upper bound on correctable quantum information, because um, you know, following because it is a it, you know a similar thing would give you the upper bound for correctable classical information. But then, uh, so roughly ten years ago, Shor and Smolin found that the five qubit bit flip code can correct can correct uh, above the hashing rate for depolarizing noise. So they got down to the second thing here, point eight zero nine six four. And then, so since then, further work had found that the five qubit bit flip code with either the five qubit phase flip code, so that's the five and five code or the five and 16 code, could yield uh, better improvements. And now what I did, I found, I found the five and 50 code. This is the optimal, um, or, or, or five, and 50, five and 51, I think, is actually the optimal. Um, it's the optimal, um, way of uh, encoding a bit flip code and the phase flip code to correct depolarizing noise. And what I did was I did this uh, calculation exactly. And then I got to had the idea of, um, well, the 513 code, it turns out, is uh, very good at correcting highly biased error. It behaves like a phase flip code or a bit flip code, if, if I mainly have phase flip or bit flip codes. So why don't I try repeatedly concatenating with that to, um, see, see, you know, just to, see if I can do it even better. And sure enough, I, I got even better. So I've, got, I've, I've improved uh, on, on what the correctable noise you can do, um, even additionally by concatenating repeatedly with the 513 code. And this provides a constructive approach for correcting noise. So here's, the, um, here's a graph of, uh, well, this is in prob terms of probability P of an error. In terms of I have a five qubit bit flip code concatenated with the N2 qubit phase flip code. As I say, I did these exactly, and the, um, and the uh, maximum is uh, around uh, N2 equals 50. Um, now, uh, so, so that, this is all uh, regular error correction. Now, I've also done some stuff with uh, fault tolerance. So there's, um, Nell had this paper in Nature where he, uh, he uses, uh, he, you know, he assumes that you have probability P of some sort of uh, depolarizing noise. So, you know, probability P over 15 of each of the non-identity two poly, um, two, two, two poly, you know, errors on two poly, from, from poly gates errors on two qubits. Um, and then he also assumed probability 4P over 15 of a measurement error. And what he does is he uses massive post-selection of ancilla qubits and then uses quantum teleportation to bring in some uh, logical data qubits. Um, and what uh, he, he found it that the uh, threshold is uh, above 3%. So what I've done is I've, I've applied these, uh, the, 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 this adaptive recovery approach. And um, so what I did was I assumed, all right, let's say, assume we have the same independent noise on each qubit. And now I created a different sort of thing than the, to, uh, to, than the teleportation ancilla. I created an ancilla that allows you to teleport uh, when you do the teleportation, it also applies C naught to the um, qubits. So I'm doing simultaneously doing um, this error detection through the teleportation scheme that Nil did, and I'm applying a C naught at the same time. And um, so the basic idea what I do is I, I find the total noise that results from this teleportation, and then I use this to try to estimate the uh, threshold. Now, it turns out there's some degeneracies that lower the thresholds, like low weight stabilizer errors. Um, I mean, low weight stabilizer elements. See, if, there, if there's a stabilizer element, I'm not going to detect this. Well, I'm doing, you know, I'm doing this massive post selection, right? I'm, I'm creating this ancilla, and if there's any error, I just throw it all out. You know, I, 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 you know, I, I take a number of levels of concatenation that I'm doing as SAP. Um, fix some fixed level, right? You know, it can be fairly large. And if there's any error anywhere, I just throw everything out. Um, 
and so the, the thing is these degeneracies lower the threshold a bit. So I corrected for the uh, degeneracies. Um, what's interesting about the degeneracies lowering the threshold is that the, as in the previous couple slides back, I mentioned how you could get above the hashing rate. Um, that was because of degenerate codes. Here, here in fault tolerant, the degenerate codes hurt you. Um, so what happens is that the, this is going to hurt your, um, you hurt your thresholds if your code is degenerate. This, this massive, I mean, this is very unrealistic, this massive post-selected threshold. And so actually, I conjecture that you, there's actually an um, upper bound that you get. And so there's like, a sha there's like a hashing rate for fault tolerance. Um, and, and so basically what you're doing is you, you can look at the total entropy of the noise. It doesn't have to be uh, independent. You know, I, I, the, I can do the entropy to correlate a noise too. So this is useful for trying to determine the thresholds. Um, so here's the, here's the bounds I get. Again, let me iterate. This is you can't get anywhere near these thresholds. These are assuming Google plexes of universes. With you know, essentially what I've done, I pick some epsilon below this threshold, and then I have to come up with some huge amount of post thick but finite amount of post selection I have to do, and some some. Um, amount of levels I have to concatenate with in order to get this threshold. Um, and and the, this assumes, you know, there's no topology consideration, um, you know, like say the previous talk, um, where the, you know, any, I'm assuming any two qubits in distant universes can interact with each other. Um, and so I, what I do is I get these upper bounds essentially for the thresholds. So this is again with uh, Nils Neumann's model. I have uh, the 713 code got 6.78 percent. Um, the 2317 code can do better because it doesn't have any uh, weight force out 6.88 percent. Um, my conjectured upper bound hashing rate uh, is 6.90 percent. So, you know, I conjecture you can't that you can't have a threshold above that for, um, for, for Nils depolarizing noise model. Um, if there were, you know, I've, I, I, I did it with other, uh, with other types of uh, noise besides that. Like, so if, for example, if you had no measurement errors, that would be a different sort of noise model. And then in this case, the uh, upper bound was 8.25%. Um, yeah, so here, here are my, um, Papers. Uh, the first one, the first one doesn't really, you know, isn't about um, this is adaptive recovery, but you know, it's that basic channel map thing where you know, you have the encoding operator, then the um, then the the noise, the recovery decoding operator. The second paper is the one that's about to be published, uh, Physical Review A Rapid, and it's. Um, and, and it, it deals with the adaptive recovery techniques. The third paper is um, the third paper is uh, showing how you can get above the uh, you know improved uh, improvement on getting above on correcting depolarizing noise above the hashing rate. I also show that all poly noise is correctable up to the hashing rate. And then the fourth paper I haven't put in the archive yet is um, is is uh, finds those fault tolerant thresholds. So, so that's it. I tried larger codes. The uh, yeah, the, the the codes I found appear to be the um, optimal. But, uh, you know, as I had uh, back. So, so this is without the five one three code. But um, see, this is this is the five and n two code. See, see, it ends up being optimal. Uh, I'd say for uh, for the five and fifty one. As you can see, the uh, it starts going down after that. What sort of noise it can correct. Yeah, then then it's not as optimal. Um, yeah, previous people found that it appeared uh, f five, five, the five and and two, you know, performed better. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I looked at the seven. You couldn't get quite as high. Um, yeah, so this this is the five and fifty one. I believe is the optimal for any bit flip code concatenating with phase flip code. Can you explain again, can you explain again why the 
Um, yeah, because the, uh, the, if I have low waste stabilizer elements, then this means that there's some sort of noise that I can't um, detect. So like let's say I have the 7 and 3 code. I have two errors on my source qubit, and I'm doing a C naught to the uh, destina I mean destination qubits, right? And I'm going to measure these destination qubits. If there are any errors, I toss them out. So if I, suppose I have two errors on the source qubits, two errors on the destination qubits. Well, they could, they could all add up to be a uh, stabilizer element on the destination qubit, which I wouldn't detect. And so that hurts me under this massive post-selection. Exactly yeah, they're the same same code. That's what you mean. No, no, you have different noise. I mean, I mean, let's say I just happen to have two errors, like uh, let's say seven one three code. I have errors on the first and third qubits, and then I have a destination. I had errors on the fifth and seventh qubits. Then I do the C naught, and now the destination has errors first, third, fifth, and seventh qubit. Well, wait, that's a stabilizer error, and I haven't detected it. Yeah, so that's that's why the stable what way stabilizer elements hurt you under this massive post selection. Yeah. 